Good evening, everyone. As you heard, the last journey into the unknown is to black holes. Black holes are favorites of the general public because they are voracious pits of doom from which nothing can escape. In contrast, they are favorites of many scientists because they are voracious pits of doom from which nothing can escape, and because the extreme nature of black holes and their environments means that by studying them, we are able to get at some very fundamental physics and astrophysics. The idea of black holes can be traced all the way back to 1783. At this time, there is a classic 18th century polymath by the name of John Mitchell, who was an astronomer, mathematician, physicist, and clergyman. They did everything in those days. And Mitchell was thinking about gravity, and especially about escape speed. We can think about escape speed. We can imagine we have an object, say this ball. If I were to give it a small upward toss, it would go a small distance before coming down. If I were to give it a higher toss, well, up it goes farther and eventually it comes down. But let's imagine that I have an almighty throwing arm. I am able to throw this more than 11 kilometers per second. And, well, let's say that being a physicist, I ignore complicating factors like the atmosphere, the roof of this building. If I had all that, then I would be able to throw completely off of the Earth because that would be the escape speed. It would never come back. Mitchell also understood Newtonian gravity. And in that sense, he was able to calculate escape speed from any object. And he knew that if you happen to have objects, the density of the sun, but at least 500 times their radius, then the escape speed would be greater than the speed of light. As a result, he imagined that we might have the most massive things in the universe could be invisible to us because the light would not be able to reach us. Our modern concept of black holes, however, is based not on Newtonian gravity, but on Einsteinian gravity. And there are some very important differences between the two concepts of gravity. One is that Mitchell would have imagined that, like the ball that I threw, light coming from one of his dark stars would go some distance struggling valiantly against gravity, only ultimately to be pulled back. He also would have supposed that it would be possible to visit one of his dark stars, hang out, have a picnic, and then leave gradually by a rocket, in the same way that when astronauts go to space or to the moon, they don't immediately start going at 11 kilometers per second. But our modern concept of black holes is far more ominous than this. You see, black holes are unique in the universe. They have no surfaces. They don't have a solid surface. They don't have a gaseous surface. Instead, they have a point of no return called an event horizon. And in our modern understanding, once you're inside that event horizon, even a little bit, you cannot make any outward progress at all. In fact, in a mathematically meaningful sense, it is the case that if you are inside the event horizon, trying to avoid falling to your grisly death inside the black hole to its singularity is the equivalent of trying to avoid Monday. You can't do it. <laughs> Another important thing about black holes is that they obey Einsteinian gravity in the sense that rather than having space like up, down, left, right, back, forth, and time like time on your watch being independent things, they are part of one entity, space-time, which is traditionally viewed as something like a rubber sheet, which can be warped by gravity. And in order to get an idea of what an effect this would have in terms of the warping of time in particular, let's imagine that collectively we are going to perform an experiment. And we're going to suppose that the curtain represents the event horizon of the black hole. You have asked a lot of very intelligent questions tonight. You're clearly a very focused group. You're giving up your Friday night in order to see these talks. You are the sort of people who are, no doubt, not only excellent contributors and future contributors, but you're probably the sort of people who don't want to die in screaming agony. So you are going to stay very far away from the black hole. In contrast, I'm an academic. I already have tenure, which means I really can't accomplish anything more in my life. Therefore, I will be the one to volunteer to go close to the black hole. We suppose that we will start out with me far enough from the way, away from the black hole, communicating to you, maybe by radio waves. And as I do this and I'm talking, everything seems fine. However, as I get closer to the event horizon, 
The closer that I get, the more that I appear to slow down until right outside the horizon I almost stop. If I were then to move away from the black hole, then the farther that I would go, the less the distortion would appear to be. And eventually, far enough away, it seems fine. One of the remarkable things about Einstein's theories of relativity is that what happens does depend a little bit on your perspective. For example, you would in fact see me slowing down and you know, talking slowly and so on. But as far as what I would see, there's a very important principle that Einstein introduced called the equivalence principle. And I like to say that this is not just a principle of physics, it's also a principle of psychology, which is to say that to you, you always seem normal. Therefore, even though you're seeing me moving slowly, if I'm close to the horizon, ha, hey, I seem to be moving totally normally to myself. But when I see you, you're moving fast and you're talking like Donald Duck on helium. It is these sorts of things that intrigue scientists wanting to study black holes. And in fact, no matter how awesome the topic is, a characteristic nature of scientists is that they have to be able to probe and push and observe and experiment. We'd like, therefore, to be able to observe black holes, learn about their properties. But if you think about it, this is actually something that is very difficult. And the difficulty comes down to an underappreciated aspect of black holes, which is that, by astronomical standards, they're really tiny. A black hole with three times the mass of our sun would fit within the capital beltway. Space is vast, seeing such tiny things at such large distances, especially because something that falls into a black hole doesn't come back out. It seems a very difficult task. As a result, we have to think of other ways of observing black holes. And effectively what we are looking for is we're looking for the effect of black holes on other things outside of it. For example, if gas spirals into a black hole, the energy it emits can be seen as long as it's outside the black hole and the energy is emitted. So this is something we can observe. But we can also look in another way. And that is, if we're able to see stars moving around something, well, that something might be a black hole. This is, in fact, an image from one of the two groups, this one from Germany, another one is in the United States, that have been tracking stars around our galactic center, 25,000 light years away. They've been looking at these orbits, and by using standard Newtonian gravity, they're able to figure out the mass around which these are orbiting. And there's nothing in that center. And that mass turns out to be about 4 million times the mass of our sun. Not only that, but based on the nature of the orbits, you can tell that this mass has to be contained within, and maybe much within, a volume only the size of the orbit of Pluto. At this stage, you may well be inclined to say, of course, we've got it, this must be a black hole. Remember, though, what Carl Sagan liked to say, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And as such, if we're thinking about the possibility of a giant black hole in the center of our galaxy, we'd be able, better be able to rule out other possibilities. So what are those possibilities that we might think of? What about the possibility that we have four million sun-type stars in this vicinity? Maybe your immediate thought is, hey, there's no way there's not enough room. But again, space is vast. Even out to a comparatively small volume like that inside of Pluto's orbit, you could fit nearly a trillion suns. So that doesn't work. Next try. Hmm. If we actually had that many stars, we'd see it. It'd be bright. You're, you'd be correct at that. However, there are many things that we know of in astronomy that have mass, but very little light. Planets, asteroids, more exotic things like neutron stars, which are also tiny enough they wouldn't hit each other. As a result, we need a more general argument to rule out this possibility. And that argument comes down to gravity. When you think about the sun, the sun is a single star. It has planets around it, we're very happy about that. But it doesn't have any stars nearby, and as a result, as it moves along in its path across the galaxy, it is hardly perturbed at all. It's a very smooth motion. But many of you may know that a lot of stars are, in fact, not single. They're in binaries, meaning they have a stellar mass companion. Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, is an example. 
And in such cases, the stars could orbit around each other in a very stable ellipse. Again, as long as you don't have any stars nearby, this can continue almost indefinitely. If you recall the principle of mathematical induction, you might be tempted at this stage to say that because one star is stable, and indeed two stars are stable, maybe it's the case that three or more stars are stable. But this is in fact not true. Instead, it turns out, even in Newtonian gravity, that if you have three or more stars in the same vicinity of comparable masses, that even if you somehow start them out in a apparently regular orbit, their gravitational perturbations will eliminate that and cause them to go into crazier and <laughs> crazier orbits that get all sorts of distorted, weird, and eventually modern more getting thrown away. If you apply these principles quantitatively to the center of our galaxy, you find that if there are actually millions of stars in the vicinity of the size of Pluto's orbit, most of them would be thrown out within a few thousand years. When you compare this with the billions of years that our galaxy has existed, this is not possible. And therefore, we are led to the remarkable and wonderful conclusion that our galaxy has a four million solar mass black hole in its center. And that black hole is a baby compared to some out there. We know of some galaxies which have black holes at their center of 20 billion times the mass of our sun. In addition, there are at least tens of millions of smaller black holes in our galaxy, so these things really exist. But we're not satisfied, right? We, we always want to push on as much as possible. And as part of this, it turns out that just the last few years, we have a remarkable new tool with which we can study black holes. This is gravitational waves. I mentioned earlier the common picture of space-time as a rubber sheet, where a rubber sheet maybe can be distorted by gravity. If you were to imagine having two heavy things on a rubber sheet moving around each other, these would produce ripples, and those ripples in space-time are called gravitational waves. As they move past things, they stretch and shrink them, but only by tiny amounts. A relatively strong one at typical distances of these sources might be a fractional distance change of 10 to the minus 21. That's the equivalent of changing the diameter of the Earth by about the size of an atomic nucleus. But by dint of extraordinary effort and 40 years of work of up to 1,000 people, it was in fact possible to detect gravitational waves. Now, the gravitational waves that have been detected this is not actually them, of course. This is a representation. We imagine we have a star field behind us. And the gravity of the black holes is warping the space-time. So the stars aren't moving, just that the light from them is being torn around like this. And on September 14, 2015, for the first time, it was possible to see the ripples in space-time from two black holes getting together. You see these go faster and faster, and eventually form one black hole, and once again, all is quiescence. Now these are being detected at the rate of about once a week. One of the great advances that we end up with over and over again in astronomy and other fields of science is when we can see something that we couldn't see before. Gravitational waves represent a completely new messenger from deep space far beyond our solar system. Not only are they a new messenger, but they're telling us about events that, okay, we couldn't see before, but are remarkably powerful. As an example, when two black holes of comparable mass come together, in the last bit of their coalescence, they send out maybe 50 times as much energy as all of the stars in the visible universe combined during that short time. These are not minor events we were missing, and the energy, the violence, means that we are in fact probing extreme physics. Something that our very first speaker indicated, and I'll echo, is that in science, a good question is one that once answered is going to allow you to consider new questions that had never occurred to you before. And in that sense, it reminds me of T.S. Eliot. We shall not cease from exploration. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Thank you.